Good morning, and you're very welcome to today's Signpost webinar, which is brought to you by Chagas in collaboration with the National Rural Network, Food Drink Ireland, Skillnet, and Dairy Sustainability Ireland. My name is Mark Gibson, and I'm manager of the Chagas Connected Program. I'm also joined by Pat Murphy, who is head of the Chagas Environment Knowledge Transfer Program, and Pat's going to be helping us with questions later on. So as National Biodiversity Weeks draws to a close, this morning we're going to be talking about results-based agri-environmental schemes. The team in the Burren Programme have developed a new approach to sustaining some of our most iconic and best-loved landscapes, and I'm delighted to be joined by one of the founders of the programme, Dr. Brendan Dunford, who is manager of the Burren Programme. Brendan, good morning to you. Good morning, Mark. Good to be here with you. You're very, very welcome. And Pat, good morning to you. Good morning. Good, good. So slightly overcast here in Galway. Imagine the same down in the Burren. Uh, yeah, very much so. After after quite the day yesterday with wind and rain and everything else in between, uh, today is slightly better, but not great. Okay, okay. Well, look, um, we're really looking forward to your presentation this morning. Could you tell us a little bit about the the work that you've been doing? You're you're well embedded now within the the Burren. It seems many years since we we sat beside each other in in UCD, and you were plugging away at your your PhD. But you know that so much has happened during since since you started working as a student there in the Burren. Yeah, it's it's over twenty years now at this stage, Mark, and I, I feel every year of it <laughs> at this point in time. But it's been it's been an amazing journey. Um, it's such a privilege to live and work in the Burren. I have to say, like it's just absolutely wonderful. But on top of that, then, I've been really lucky to meet some great people and work with some great people. And if I was ever to give anybody a word of advice, it's to surround yourself with great people. It makes life a lot easier. So I think it's been great. And we're still very ambitious in terms of what we want to achieve and where we're going with it. So the story is, is it's ongoing. We always think we get a lot of sort of praise and kudos in the burn for what we do, but it very much is a work in progress and there's an awful lot more to do. So we're certainly not letting our foot off the gas just yet. I think you've you've really um, really shown the 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 spirit of partnership and what that can achieve in the Burren by working with various different partners. Uh, all seem to be at very much uh, an equal status in in any of the, the the projects that you're involved in. I think that probably is one of the success factors. I know that even across the EU, the Burren program is used as as a a, a great example of that. Yeah, and it's interesting to reflect on, on like when I came here initially. Um, I mean, there was a lot of hostility, um, I suppose, between farmers and some of the authorities, and even within the authorities and across the authorities. Uh, and it kind of reminds me of some of some of the stuff that's going on there today. That you know, you have the environmentalists, so called, on one side, and the farmers on the other, which really isn't on the ground. Really, isn't the case, but it's that's the perception that's out there in the media. So I think coming from a kind of a place where environment was a dirty word um, here a number of years ago, I think it's really nice to be in a position now where farmers uh, not just see, but realise the opportunities that um, environmental um, services uh, delivery can, can bring. Um, I've always seen the challenges around biodiversity and climate, and we'll be talking about them in a minute, as not just challenges, but opportunities as well. And it's been our job here and our privilege to kind of try and exploit some of those opportunities for farmers and for the community and for wider society over the years. Brendan, there's, there's obviously there's, there's some division at the moment appearing in the, the, the media around environmental movement and the, the and farming. And I know you've been involved in the, the agri-food uh, strategy uh, 2030 that we had Tom Arnold speaking about a number of weeks ago. Um, you know, more often than not, I look at it and say, look, there's, there's probably often more common ground than, than both parties realise um, what's your your assessment of of the situation? Yeah, I think there's that, and there's the Antashka thing with with the Glombie at the moment. So it's, it's quite. I think it's very unfortunate because my experience on the ground is that some of the best environmentalists I've met are actually farmers, and um, you know, and I think I've, I've I've worked a lot in environmental circles, and and we set up my wife and I an NGO years ago, an environmental NGO called Burn Bio, and that's hugely engaged in the local community and the environment. So I think we tend to be guided by the polar extremes, um, you know, the extreme um, intensive farming perspective and then the, uh, the extreme environmental perspective um, sometimes as well, whereas the middle ground is where it's at. And even within those committees like agri-food, which are very much new to me, I think ultimately it's about finding a compromise that works, um, you know. And to me, a lot of that is about empathising with 
other people's perspective, seeing where they're coming from, understanding where they're coming from, not criticizing it, but trying to move them then to a different place. So it's the, host the hostility and the kind of polarization really doesn't help. And uh, we need everybody on board in partnership at the moment. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm all for having meaningful compromises um, uh, to make progress. And I think um, hopefully the agri-food strategy will, um, but it'll all depend, Mark, on how it's, how it's delivered. You know, the, the plan is one thing, the delivery yes. is what it's all about. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Look, um, we might ask you to share your screen with us and um, we, we look forward to your presentation. If, if people have questions for uh, Brendan, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. And a reminder that today's uh, record, uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available afterwards on the Chagas website along with the actual presentation itself. So Brendan, we'll hand over to you and uh, we'll chat to you afterwards. Great. So you can see my screen okay, Mark? Yeah, that looks great. Yeah, so great. Uh, listen, thanks for the invitation to, to talk. I've been following uh, the webinars um, uh, over as many Fridays as, 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 as I could, and uh, there's been some great speakers on it, and I hope <laughs> I hope I can live up to the, to the standard. Um, what I wanted to tell you today was basically, you know, a story from the burn, but to, but to tell it in such a way that gives it a broader relevance, maybe to the, the audience here today. Um, my day job is manager of the Burn program. Um, I'm very involved in a local NGO called the Burn Bio Trusts as well, and also a founder of something called Farming for Nature, which very much speaks to this notion of the, uh, hearing the farmer's voice when it comes to the whole um, sustainability issue. So today I wanted to talk about, um, I suppose the key challenge really, isn't it? It's been the key challenge for me and the key challenge for society now is how do we motivate farmers um, to address the climate and biodiversity emergency? Uh, how do we do that? It's not saying that farmers are responsible for it. I see farmers as the solution, uh, part of the solution at least, but how do we motivate them to become that solution, to, to be that solution? That's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, it's a bit of a bur burning journey. I just wanted to say um, that, you know, the work we've been doing here um, has been going on for a long time, um, over 20 years at this point, uh, uh, initially some research and then uh, uh, European funded burn life project and so on and so on. And I'd also like to um, emphasize the fact that, you know, it's not just about me. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of many. I, I, I've just been so lucky to work with great people like Michael Davern here, who's the local farm leader who, who got this whole show on the road. Great ecologists like Sharon Parr and James Moran and people like Bridget Barry, um, um, uh, many, many people. So all I'm saying is this is a, this is a, the, the credit from this is, is, um, is, is due to many people. But, it remains a work in progress, like I said. So we're not claiming to have cracked it completely, but we're working on it and we're making good progress. Because before I started, um, I just wanted to celebrate Biodiversity Week. Um, like I'm, I'm struck that in the environmental world, when we're dealing with agri-environmental programs and stuff, it's a lot about policy and you know the measures and the payment levels and all that. And sometimes we forget about what it is we're ultimately dealing with. Um, it's this amazing biodiversity that we have in Ireland. Um, I think compared to many European countries, we're, we're very, very fortunate um, to have what we have. We're a little bit behind maybe the developmental curve that, that caused a lot of our biodiversity to be lost in Northwest Europe. So we still have a lot. And I suppose the burn is a microcosm of that. And um, I'm very lucky in the sense that I'm here in an office in Karen, um, stuck by the desk for most of the day. But when I get out, I get out into something like this, and it's so um, revitalizing and empowering and affirming to be out in that. So that's the burn um, around now. So you can see the carpet of, of white flowers, mountain avens, and the spikes of the orchids, just amazing color, tiny little pinpricks of color and detail on the landscape. And looking at them close up, we have the Arctic mountain avens and the Mediterranean dense flowered orchid growing side by side in the burn, which is really extraordinary, an Arctic and a Mediterranean plant, a cold weather and warm weather plant growing side by side um, in the barn. He had the iconic gentian, which is flowering profusely um, over the last few weeks. Um, uh, it's, it's coming to an end at the minute, but this little plant, which farmers you know, are so familiar with in the barn, this little plant draws visitors from as far away as Australia. Um, and it really wouldn't be here without the farming systems to, to, to clear back the dense grasses. So I think there's that connection between the farming, the flora and the broader um, business and development of, of, of the barn through tourism. 
you have extraordinary plants. Uh, uh, you know, again, you can walk right by these or any the size of my 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 um, uh, uh, nail on my, on my little finger. But the fly orchid and the bee orchid, these little orchids which live in Ireland here in our country, but which resemble insects as a way of attracting cross pollinators to, to, to spread their seed. Extraordinary plants, um, uh, and, and any farmer would be proud to have those on their land. Then you have burn specialities like the. Uh, dark red hellebrine, which grows right out there in the pavements, a thing of great beauty, um, which survives on the bare rocky landscape. You have these um, plants again, which grow on the rock. This is wood sage, and that plant was gathered from places like the barn three, four hundred years ago and sold at the markets in Dublin as a cure for mortifications and gangrenes. So if, if anybody this morning is suffering from uh, being mortified <laughs> or being gang gangrenous, then this is your plant. And we're very connected with plants once upon a time for, for, for cures and so on. So, you know, let's not forget that connection. And then folklore, we have this little grass, not the most productive grass in the world. It might find its way onto a, a lot of your farms. It relies on very nutrient poor soils. It's um, breeze and media or quaking grass, but in the barn we call it famine grass because it's set to grow where people die during the famine, this little grass sprouts up. And if you walk across uh, the barn and you tread on this grass, you feel the hunger pangs coming up from the ground. And they say the only cure of it is to have a hazelnut in your pocket. But ever since I've been coming here, farmers will talk about the fair gorte. Uh, and to them, it means having that weakness when you're out herding cattle. You feel the weakness, the hunger coming upon you. And you have to, you know, you have, you have to get off and have a bit of a, <laughs> a feed for yourself to counteract it. And then you have medicinal plants if, uh, for people who suffered from sleep deprivation uh, once upon a time. This is the plant that you picked. Um, ladies' bed straw, profuse in the barn and elsewhere during the summertime, but once used as a sleeping agent, you stuff the pillow with this little plant to help you to sleep. Um, and then you have plants of extraordinary beauty. Um, this again is one of our native flora. This is Parnasia palustris, the grass of Parnassus, an extraordinarily beautiful plant um, that you find um, growing in wettish areas of, of the barn. A lot of you will be familiar with this plant, it grows right across Ireland. Um, uh, uh, um, it's uh, many names and lots of folklore associated with this. And the names alone will give you some indication of, of some rather rude interpretations of the plants, like uh, red hot poker, snakes meat, willy lily, cows and bulls, jack in the pulpit. So pl <laughs> plants can be fun as well. You, don't, uh, uh, you can um, read a lot into these and, 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 and the interpretations that are once placed upon them. Uh, that's a plant that's just quite commonly out at the moment as well. And finally, just a plant, well, favorite plant of mine is, I don't know how, how many of you out there will recognize it, but it's a plant that can tell a huge story. It's called yellow rattle. Um, it's a parasitic, semi-parasitic plant. It parasitizes grasses, so it weakens the grasses and um, reduces the nutrient levels in the grassland, which allow, allows a lot of different herbs to colonize. So it's a real favorite of conservationists and this is widely used for restoring grasslands um, for a more species rich status in, in the UK. I have, I have a little field beside my house at home and every year there's more and more of this. And a farmer who grazes the field for me and cuts silage off it is just beside himself with, with sort of frustration <laughs> at this plant because you can see his grass crop reducing every year as the yellow rattle spreads. And he says to me, look, you're making me look bad. Um, this field is in an awful state. Um, and I can completely understand this perspective because production wise, there's less and less out of it, less value out of it. Uh, um, uh, but in terms of nature conservation, there's, you know, growing value all the time. And it's that kind of conflict between, you know, the farmers need to make a living and uh, nature's uh, need to find a space in, in the whole thing, which, which is, is, I suppose, the focus of my talk this morning. So that's just a happy biodiversity week. Let's not forget uh, what it's all about. <laughs> Now, getting back to the burn, um, I'm going to take you through, as I said, a quick uh, journey over the next 20 minutes um, ab ab about what we're doing. Um, this is just a picture of the burn. And I suppose just to summarize very quickly what's been happening is that over the last, I suppose, 50 years now, 40, 50 years, there's been huge changes in farming. Um, there's always changes in farming, but in the last 50 years, they've been just so massive and profound and, and, and quick, um, speedy to happen that nature hasn't had a chance to adjust. Um, and in the burn and elsewhere, this is reflected either in under farming or over farming, too much or too little. Um, typically in the burn, you get um, very intensive farming on, on, on the more greenland areas and very extensive, less and less farming in the lowlands. And if you look at what happens with, you know, more intensive farming, um, where you can, this still happens, there's um, land reclamation, receding fertilization, 
which really, you know, um, your biodiversity does disappear um, or radically reduce. Uh, the feeding of silage is, is a point source issue in, in, in that regard. So very intensive activity in a certain place, um, damage to water, damage to soils and so on. So that's one element of it. Uh, and that is happening, uh, not just in the burn, but elsewhere. Um, and, and we know um, that it's happening in certain parts of Ireland at the moment. But what we tend not to talk about as much is when you stop farming or reduce farming, you do get a lot of scrub encroachment, which is nice, but the flowers don't survive that because the gentians and the orchids need open, uh, most of them need open space and light. And the archaeology, this is a wedge tomb, um, four and a half thousand years old. The, the growth of scrub really helps, um, causes the collapse of these wedge tombs, um, damaging um, archaeology. So what we're trying to do is find a balance um, where we can sustain the right type of farming in the burn uh, and, and therefore look after the natural and cultural heritage. And of course, I keep emphasizing that this isn't unique to the burn, this issue. Right across Europe, there's about 30 million hectares of this high nature value type farmland, which is in declining condition because of those polarizing forces. So the question is, what do we do about it? Well, when we think about farming, we think about, you know, farmers out there on the land producing milk and producing meat and producing these important food commodities. But maybe there's also another perspective, and this is the one of ecosystem services. Now, food is an ecosystem service, but so is, you know, biodiversity and pollinators, cultural heritage, clean water and soils, fresh, healthy air, clean air, carbon storage. So these are all things that farmers can also produce by managing the land in a certain way. So unfortunately, the only market at the minute is for the meat and the milk. And as a result, um, farmers often produce these at the expense of the other ecosystem services. Um, you know, why not? And this is something that is a really profound learning for me in the barn, going in uh, to a farmer's house, uh, rather than criticizing that farmer for maybe clearing some beautiful barn habitat, sitting down and trying to understand why. And when that farmer explains it to you, look, this is what I get paid for. This is what I've been advised to do. And this is what we do as farmers. Then you come out of it thinking, the only way I'll change the farmer's mind, the only way I'll turn the farmer around to look at ecosystem services is by putting a value on them, supporting the farmer to deliver them, and also convincing that farmer that this is the right thing to do for himself, his family, and his community. And that's the journey we've been on for the last number of years. So this morning, I'm just going to talk about in a very general sense, but drawing on our lessons from the barn, this key thing of how do we motivate farmers to deliver more of these ecosystem services, more farmers delivering more services. And I'm going to be fairly simplistic here, but to me it comes down to three things. Um, three things, this is what I've learned. The pocket, obviously it has to pay. Farming is a business, it has to pay. But don't ever make the mistake that it's just about the money, because it's not, it really isn't. It's also about um, the technical support, the headpiece, um, and it's also about the heart. And we forget about that all the time, that you have to have those ingredients in place. I often think if I'm about to buy an electric car, which I was thinking about recently, it's got to make sense financially to do that. Um, you know, it's got to be, uh, be affordable and, you know, compared to other uh, conventional models. The headpiece, you've got to know that you can service it. You've got to know that if you want to recharge it, and if you drive into Dublin, you can do that. And you got to you know, believe in this notion of by buying this car, I'm doing something good. Now, I didn't buy an electric car because it was out of my price range and I wasn't convinced that I could get a charge uh, uh, on my way to Dublin. I still like to do it, um, but those three ingredients aren't in place that so I didn't act. But I think for farming uh, and farms to act for biodiversity, I think ideally we need these three ingredients to be addressed. So we have to basically make a better proposition to farmers than the one that's on offer now. And I fully believe the farmers will adopt it if we do, but we just haven't done a very good job so far. And I, I say that as somebody who's, who's involved in that whole area. So I'm going to give you three examples of the pocket, the head and the heart. Um, and uh, with the pocket, we realized a long time ago that unless we put a value on the Eureka system services, um, farmers, uh, we wouldn't be able to persuade them to deliver. So we came up, my colleague Sharon Power, with a very simple scoring system reflecting um, the environmental health of each field on the farm and also the effort the farmer put in to uh, improving that health. A very simple zero to 10 scoring system. And you can see three scenarios here, um, really rubbish, um, not great and fantastic. And it's a very simple thing to do. Don't let anybody tell you it's not to come up with a scoring system to reflect that and then to reward the farmer accordingly. And we've been doing that now for 11 years, uh, 12 years this year, and it works really well. Farmers completely get it. 
It's the same thing as bringing your cow to the market. The better condition of the animal, the more money you're going to get. Same thing with your environment uh, and uh, at a field level, we're, we're paying for it. How we've made that happen? I think people agree with the principle, but they think it might be too complicated. Nonsense. A very simple scorecard. Um, we assess the fields once a year. The farm advisors who are fantastic do that once a year. And then we explain it to the farmer. Uh, it translates then into a payment system. So no payment for scores less than four, um, less than five rather. And then bonus payments for nines and tens. So if you put a real premium price on the, on the quality product, like a pedigree product. Um, we have a ceiling of, pay, of, of, of payments. You can get 315 per hectare max um, um, for the best of the best. And that doesn't happen too often. Uh, you have a ceiling in terms of the overall payment of 10 grand. The average we actually pay is about 2,700. So there's ways of managing it. And the other really important thing is that we have a particular system here where we pay uh, on, on, on different bands. So zero to 10 hectares, 10 to 40, 40 to 80. Uh, and it's it's the payment rate goes down as you go along the bands. But without dwelling on it too much, we have a system of inverted payments where we pay on the lowest scoring fields at the highest rate. And that's very simple innovation, really pushes farmers to focus on the poor scoring fields and to address the problems there, thereby in, improving the environment. Our colleagues in the freshwater pearl mussel have, have, have a similar approach, and they also offer um, an approach where if a farmer is causing maybe point source pollution that his overall payment is reduced. So with the payments, the whole purpose of, of it is to reward the guy who delivers the most and not to reward the person who's not delivering. It's very simple. It's very, very effective. The second term thing in terms of the pocket is that, you know, um, if you want to improve the environmental health, you've got to do work. So, for instance, if a farmer has a, a mucky spring, that's going to reduce his field score or reduce his payment. But there could be quite a big capital cost in addressing that. Um, it could be solar panels to pump the water somewhere else and so on. So we provide funding, um, uh, co-funding with the farmer to, to, to address those issues. So every farmer in our program has access to a fund based on the area of his land which allows them to address the water issues, scrub encroachment issues, um, wall repair issues, um, access, different things like that. We uh, never tell the farmer what to do. The farmer decides with his advisor what he would like to do, what he thinks would work to improve his score, and we will co-fund that action with him if we believe to deliver environmental value. And again, it works really well. It's very farmer friendly. The farmer draws up a plan, uh, with a bunch of actions. You can do a plan, um, up to five plans over five years. Every action is described um, on a map and in a little plan like that. The farmer gets his map and his plan. He knows what each job is worth. So he either himself or gets contractors to carry out the work. Once the work is done, one job or all the jobs, he comes into the local office here and he gets paid. Very simple, very flexible, very responsive. And that's how it has to be because, you know, uh, over time, you realize what needs to be done and you do it better and you can innovate and so on. So we, we give that flexibility to our farmers. So that's an important financial incentive as well to deliver these ecosystem services. And thirdly, then, like if farmers are generating additional ecosystem services, they're also generating additional opportunities. So we have a database of about 60 local farmers who offer their services to other farmers, repairing walls, removing scrub. That's a really good part-time um, opportunity for those farmers. We have five different people now making uh, gates locally, um, um, which is a little mini business in itself. And we have farmers leading walks, um, often for charity, in this case for the Burnbill Trust, but a lot of the farmers now are starting to get paid just to tell the people about how they farm their land and why. And it is an extraordinary, I've been on many, many of these walks, and it's an extraordinarily empowering experience for the farmer to recognise that he or she is appreciated by society when they understand what he or she does. And likewise for society to get an insight into the realities of farming in, in a landscape like, like the barn. So just creating these new opportunities added value in terms of maybe education, tourism, food and service provision. And there was a little piece of research done recently which showed that the barn program generated 20 jobs in addition to um, um, uh, the jobs of the local team and, and, and the farm advisors, 20 local jobs have been generated this year for businesses, contractors, and so on. And it's promoting opportunities for tourism and, and stuff like that as well. And here's just a nice little case study in that. This is um, one, of the, one, of, one of our best, very best farmers, Oliver Nagel and his family. Uh, and Oliver has a small enough wintage, rocky enough wintage in the burn. He'd be kind of typical in that regard. Um, it wouldn't be a big wintage. 
it would be it would keep maybe 12 or 14 cows over the winter i guess um for four or five months so it's, it's a value but oliver loves his winterage but what he's done over the years himself and his father pat um he's increased his grazing levels by 20 percent um uh, so he's up the stock he gets a payment now for each field based on the biodiversity value and the, the, the water management and stuff like that uh, and because he scores so highly he gets quite a, quite a payment for that he's got contractors employed um, from around many local farmers cutting the scrub fixing the walls uh fixing the water points as well uh he's buying i think he's bought about 12 or 14 of these barn gates which are sourced from a guy a few a few miles down the road he's um has tour groups all the time including the prince charles when he came over to the burn uh, but so many tour groups from all over the world who are coming here to learn about sustainable farming he buys his burn ration, which is a, 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 a local feed we developed, um, James Moore and ourselves developed many years ago, chocolate support, uh, feeds that that's sourced locally, um, and um, supports us as a local team. We wouldn't be here if the farmers weren't here to, 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 to need our services, but he has archaeologists and so on. So that's the essence of rural development, and it's based on the relationship between the farmer and the land. All these extra benefits and employment come from that relationship when it's done right. I'm not for a minute saying that all of the farmers are achieving those, um, those outcomes, but it just shows you what's possible when, when, when we do it right. Now the headpiece, this notion of um, like farming for nature or farming for ecosystem services, like if you're a beef farmer or dairy farmer, you have access to you know, great organizations like Chagas who will support you and, and commission great research and share and, and all that. I'd have to say that it's not quite the same when it comes to the environmental management um, it's not that simple, um, uh, and it does need research and it does need um, innovation as well. So one of the biggest problems we had in the burn um, over the recent decades was the feeding of silage on winter, just not just because of the point source pollution, not just because of the diseases that came with it, like coccidiosis and so on, but because when cattle were eating silage, they weren't foraging, and when they weren't foraging, we had massive scrub encroachment. So it's a big issue. He said to farmers, could you not stop doing that? Well, no, you can't because these animals need nutrition um, during January, February, March. The burn can't provide it. So you need an alternative source. So local farmers suggested, why not build a burn specific feed ration? So we sampled the burn grassland, saw what was missing in terms of nutrients and, and, and micronutrients and so on, and built a ration with Chagas and Kerry um, Co-op support at the time, which contained all those missing minerals and, and, and nutrients. Uh, it's an Irish barley based um, uh, ration. And we tested that on 20 farms and the farmers demonstrated to other farmers. And by now we've largely solved that problem um, in many farms on the burn. And the consequence is far less pollution, far better animal health outcomes, far greater levels of grazing and greater biodiversity outcomes as a result. So this is the kind of the innovative research that can take place at the farm level that's desperately needed to solve these problems. And a lot of the innovation and the ideas are out there amongst farmers themselves, like the use of horses to restore um, neglected grasslands. Cattle might touch some of these areas to have gone too, too bad or too sour, but horses will. So you can bring one farmer brought 50 or 60 horses into his farm for, for a year uh, to restore it and then brought his cattle back again. And he's transformed his average score from about a five or six up to an eight or a nine. We've had innovations around water provision, so the old water harvesters uh, being built, these are both new ones, being built by farmers in remote locations where you can't get electricity uh, and you can't have any natural springs, so you just gather the water from, from, uh, from the sky, basically. And then sharing those solutions, so a big part of our work in the Barn Programme is sharing those solutions. So, research at farm level, um, co-creating solutions with farmers, I think, is critical because particularly with the environmental side of things, a lot of the solutions are very context specific. So you have to have the farmers on board and innovate at that local level. Then there's the training support. Um, like we do a lot of uh, training. No, we haven't with COVID for the last while with farmers on like why it is we're doing what we do and how we're proposing to do it uh, and, and so on. So we bring the farmers out into the field or into the classroom a lot. And there's a great response, there's a great appetite for this because it's farmers can relate to it, it's practical information, it relates to their location, their community, their place, so they, they really follow up on it. And really importantly, um, having that at local level is, is critical. So our office, where I'm calling from right now, is an old schoolhouse, smack bang in the centre of the barn, and our door is always open. So if the farmer's got a problem with the barn programme, he knows he can find me and give me shit. Uh, 
or if he's got a problem with the department of ag, rather than hanging on the phone line, he's going to come in and I'm going to sort it out for him. And that's as it should be. We want the farmers farming. We don't want them farting around on, on, on extended phone calls all the time. So we come in, we help them out. For instance, with permissions. If you want to do something simple in the barn, you need permission from National Parks, National Monuments, the local authority, the Forest Service. We sort out all that out for you so you can get on with your farming. And we have videos and stuff like that as well. And I think this local approach has been the key to the success of the EIP projects because farmers feel that they're being looked after. They feel that, you know, they have access at a local level. They feel it's their program. And this is why I think these programs work so very well, providing that uh, support at the local level. And just the third point then on, 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 on this notion of, of, of uh, the how-to, I really believe that farmers have a lot of the solutions themselves uh, uh, and they have the hard-worn experience to, to speak with authenticity on, about those solutions and to speak with incredible eloquence. So we set up something called Farming for Nature about four years ago to, to tap into that. So we have videos, there's about 30, 40 videos from extraordinary farmers across Ireland, like John McHugh here. Incredible, absolutely incredible. We have online forum where farmers can post questions and have it answered by other farmers. We have webinars every Monday um, over winter. We have uh, maybe 20 or 30 of them. And to a, to, a to a person, each farmer we've had hosting those webinars has been outstanding in terms of their knowledge and their ability to communicate it. Here's Mimi Crawford, I think, in this one. We have podcasts, which are a joy. Tommy Early did an amazing podcast. So if you go to far farmingfornature.ie, you'll find that. We have farm walks. We have one tomorrow um, um, with Andrew Bergen up in, up in Kildare. I'm hoping to get along to incredible sources of information. We have um, a lot of best practice guides. And the difference with these ones uh, is all the information on it has been garnered from speaking to farmers. So farmers as a learning resource, huge. But really importantly, farmers will heed other farmers um, before they'll heed the so-called expert like myself. So it's that peer-to-peer -peer learning, I think, is really important. And as we journey into the future where we're talking about ecosystem service and sustainability, the role of the peer-to-peer -peer learning is going to become more and more important. Finally, just the, the, the heart piece, and this is something that I think is badly neglected. Um, and we talked about before with Mark about this, this negative narrative that's there at the moment. We need to change that around. It's ridiculous. The people I meet on the ground are positive. They're can-do people. And we need to get that out into the, the public realm more, that, that voice. So we set up this Farming for Nature Ambassadors Programme. Um, and there's a lovely quote here, to change the world, let's start by changing the way we talk about it. And let's highlight those initiatives that are having a positive impact on people and on the planet to renew our confidence and spur us into action. I remember Francis Shannon from RTE years ago said to me, you'll catch an awful lot more flies with honey than vinegar. And I think we need to put the vinegar aside and have a bit more honey in our lives. Um, so we've identified ambassadors right across Ireland. These are basically farmers who are doing great things for nature. Um, they could be hill farmers, sheep farmers, tillage farmers, horticulturalists. Uh, I've met a lot of these people, and these are my um, uh, environmental heroes. These are the real nature conservationists. These are the real environmentalists. And this is why I don't understand this, this chasm that has emerged between farmers and, env and environmentalists, so-called. These people are extraordinary. They do it on a day in, day out basis, uh, and they're exceptional. And we've recognized that by having this ambassador award every year. We'd like to have uh, a few of these in every county as a source of inspiration and ideas and knowledge to other farmers across Ireland. So that's that's the first thing, giving, giving these farmers a, a, a voice. The second thing is, I think we focus an awful lot on, on, on just farmers and farming, but I mean, farmers are part of a broader community. Uh, there's younger farmers who haven't even started yet, like these kids in the picture. There's older farmers who've retired, but they still have a role to play. So we, through the Burnfield Trust especially, invest hugely in, in these communities. So we've been running a course, um, telling, uh, uh, teaching, working with local kids in the community in about 20 schools. And most of these are farmers, sons and daughters. And the idea is that they learn about their place and why their place is so special at a global level, because these are the future guardians of the landscape. And since we started that program, we've had about 3,000 kids have come through a 10-week course learning all about the flora, the fauna, the archaeology and stuff. So that when they grow up, they don't look for experts about the barn. They look to each other. They've taken ownership of their story and of their landscape. And I think we need to reconnect with place and make that connection stronger if we're to have any hope of solving some of the problems that we have. So it's a fun way to learn about your place. It's a great way to develop um, you know, a knowledge of, of 
geographical, historical, you know, the whole lot of issues. It's the best curriculum um, you'll ever find. So I think that's an important one to do. And finally, the notion of celebration. Um, I think this is really important. Um, when we talk about farming, um, often when we think about farming, we think about the commodities that are produced, but we need to view farming with a broader lens, that the right type of farming in certain parts can deliver extraordinary uh, um, you know, values, not just food, but tradition, cultural heritage, biodiversity, supporting archaeology, um, healthy soils, healthy air, healthy water. That needs to be captured. To me, the plowing championship is amazing, but it doesn't quite capture that. Um, so we set up a little festival ourselves um, um, for a good number, 10 years ago, I think now, um, uh, a few of us. And the high point of the festival is where one farmer brings their cattle um, up onto the barn um, in September, late October every year. And that's sort of, um, they bring the community with them. So everybody gets to be a farmer for a day. And you can see from this picture, if you follow my cursor, you can see the farmer here. But the line of people goes back down here and all the way along this road and all the way back to the village of Karen. There must have been a thousand people following the farmer that day. And the farmer was a young farmer, Aoife Ford, um, from the burn, smart as, um, eloquent as, spoke to the thousand people and said, OK, let's all be a farmer for today. That picture, her picture and her story is covered in the Irish Times and Farmer's Journal. She really wowed people with her burn story. And that's the kind of story we want to get out, that celebratory message around the type of farming that we're neglecting and maybe forgetting a little bit, putting it back on the map. So I think uh, that's been really important as well. And the lovely thing about Aoife is she was one of the first graduates from that little schools program I showed you before. So it's coming full circle. So the question is, and I'm finishing now, um, last two slides. Like, so what, you pocket hidden heart? What's all this crap about? You're only waffling. Well, you know, I am, <laughs> but I'm not. Because I really am talking about what we've learned over the last couple of years, uh, last 20 years, rather. And look, the devil is in the detail. You can't, um, you can't um, ignore the science. We monitor every farm in every field and every farm every year. And we've done that for the last 12 years. So we can, we can actually, hand on heart, stand over our data. And we've shown that every single year, our 2015, when we're transit, transiting between two um, caps, that there's been an increase in the overall environmental health of the burn, um, those areas managed by the burn program. So that curve, that upward curve speaks for itself. We had an external evaluation um, commissioned by the Department of Ag last year, which showed that um, there's been about 33 million euros worth of landscape biodiversity improvements since 2010. Now that 33 million figure was um, based on the notion that without the burn program, that the environment would have stayed as it is. And we know that it wouldn't. So if you were to project the environmental might decline, that figure would rise to about 60 million. Uh, so that's a huge return on investment um, for the 1 million that we spend every year. So it does work. We don't have it all solved yet. We have plenty of farmers who aren't fully engaged, but it really does work um, if you get to do it right. So conclusion, um, my theory um, uh, or my belief is that we have a climate and biodiversity emergency. We're, we're told that by the scientific community, I, I can see it out, out and about there. But I think farmers um, can be not just the solution, but the first responders to this climate and biodiversity crisis. I'm not saying they are, I'm saying they can be. But if they're to be, um, I think we, we need to start um, by changing, shifting the paradigm and, for instance, start by designing better, more farmer-friendly farm support to make that happen. And for me, some of the key principles are the fact that, you know, the, that local dimension, I think that's critically important. Farmers have a great private place and we need to, you know, have locally designed and managed programs to, to make this work. Fairness is a huge thing. I think for farmers, they want to earn the money. The comp I don't like this word compensation. Uh, farmers earning money uh, and that money should reflect both effort and outcome. So I'm all for result-based programs. They, they, they work for me really well and they reward the guy who does the most. Flexibility, I think, is huge for farmers. Um, it's not all about the money for the farmers. It's about the freedom to farm and to make uh, up your mind when you get up in the morning what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And the approach we have gives the farmers huge freedom in, 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 in how to manage their land, what kind of works they want to do or not huge room to innovate and to adapt to climate and weather and disease conditions and so on. Simplicity, um, we kind of pioneered the one page farm plan many, many years ago, and I think it's, it's, it's become the standard now, uh, but keep it simple. Minimize this need for receipts, keep the paperwork out of it so the farmers can get on with farming, support farmers to get the permission that they need to do the work. Uh, it's really important um, to do that, keep it as simple as possible. 
I think an important principle for farmers is long lasting. So these schemes come and go. And one minute you're telling me this, now you're telling me that. We need to invest long term in um, these environmental programs and have a continuity of support and of payments to build trust within the farming community. And I think um, the last um, thing I think that's important to mention is we need, I'd love to see an agri environmental program that farmers are excited to be in, that are talking about, yeah, if we do this, look, the outcomes we're going to get. Uh, too often it's about, you know, represented as, uh, yeah, this, this is, you know, this, this is kind of what you'll get now and we just do that and no questions asked. We need to really get people excited and on board. And I think that'll, that'll be the change that, that will make things happen and make it fun and celebratory as opposed to negative and, 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 and limiting. Oops, last slide. If anybody wants um, uh, information on any of these, uh, I've done a quick summary this morning, but Burn Programme, Farm of Nature, Burn Blood Trust and the Burn Winter Festival, you'll find it all of those connections. So listen, thanks very much and um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks so much, Brendan. Um, inspiring as always, despite the, 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 the cloudy day outside. Um, I, you know, it re really is remarkable the, the work that you're doing down there at, at, at the, at the, uh, in the Boron uh, in cooperation with all of the various different stakeholders. Um, the, I mean, the key question I think a lot of people would be have in their minds is how can we replicate or how can we, you know, draw some threads from this at, at, at a, a larger scale or is this something that you think needs to be like local is the word I'm hearing on a, on a regular basis throughout your your presentation and that that go to place that you have you know where, where, where farmers can call to uh, without any barriers as such you know to, to just to be able to to find out is it as, as a matter of interest actually is that uh, farmers do farmers pay for that service or uh, how is that funded? Is that funded no, centrally? No, um, that's funded. Um, we're like we're on contract. Uh, the team and I. There's I think six was part time. Um, uh, we're on contract to the Department of Ag, so we're providing a service um, to the farmer. We're kind of we see ourselves marked as being kind of on the farmer's side, supporting the farmers to deliver the environmental outcomes. Um, just to answer your first question, like we've had so many visiting groups here over the years, and the first thing we always say to them is, look. We know the burn is different. We know that um, it's not like what you have at home, but don't dismiss us on that basis. The lessons um, we're dealing with here are all about the relationship between the farmer and the land and how to enhance that relationship. And the principles we apply uh, kind of apply anywhere. And they're all bloody common sense. There's no great gen genius down here come up with these innovative ideas. This is just common sense. It's respect for the farmer, respect for the environment and trying to find that marriage. And you'll not always get it. Hmm. The key thing is here, where you don't get it, you don't pay for it. When you do get it, you do pay for it. So I think the local approach, um, the result-based payment is critically important. Having a farmer-friendly uh, model, which farmers can really buy into and, and get engaged with, I think is hugely important. So th those key principles and being adaptable. I mean, we had a chat with Pat before about this. These environmental priorities um, and how we address them are changing all the time. We have to be able to adapt to that. We have to recognize that uh, the weather is different now every year. So we have to give farmers the space to adapt without people abusing it, of course. But I think simple principles like that, Mark, is what we can offer um, farmers and others elsewhere. So I'd like the people here this morning, especially not to think this as, uh, yeah, sure, aren't they great down in the barn? Let them off, fair play to them. It's not about that. It's uh, what I'm trying to say this morning is that these principles can and should really play us for. Mm. I think your your comment or your your definition there, or not using the word compensation, is so important. It really goes to the heart of it that this is a valuable service, and that uh, uh, you know farmers uh, are earning the, what they they make from from producing and, and delivering on these eco, uh, ecosystem services. And I, I really do like your 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 phrase, the first responders as well. That 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 is another. Uh, concept that I think we should we should put to the fore of any of our our our, our plans and and policies around uh, agri environmental schemes that the, the solutions are there it's 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 getting farmers uh, uh, at the table at equal footing at the table Pat a lot of uh, questions a lot of interest in in the yeah, huge, technical uh, aspects of the scheme as well and scoring cards and so forth yeah and huge positivity I'll just give you one scientific challenge that's been posed to us. It says, what a brilliant injection of positivity. Thank you for, uh, sorry, thank you, uh, Dr. Brendan Dunford. You ought to be cloned and distributed widely. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just, I suppose, 
Uh, just a, 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 a question uh, that arose very quickly when you showed the, the first group of farmers. Uh, it, it commented about the gender balance of the, of the farmers, but uh, later on in your presentation, you showed the ambassadors where there was a, a strong female uh, 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 representation and, and then your, your uh, representative farmer there at the end. But I suppose it raises a serious question about the uh, ability of the uh, programme to help the broader community and the integration of, of all members of, of the community. Completely. Uh, and, and we, we sort of, within the farming community, I mean, we have, we have all sorts of farmers, big, uh, uh, small, dairy, beef, tillage, male, female, organic, conventional. I suppose, uh, just looking at our, our, our um, in the barley, we have about maybe 10% female farmers, so they're there, they're not as well represented, but I'd be the first person to say that, uh, you know, um, it's the farm family we're talking about here, both in terms of the Burn Programme, the Farm for Nature Ambassadors, we focus on the notion of the farm family, because I think the farmer, as Mark will attest <laughs> from this morning, he needs the support of the kids, the wife, you need a whole uh, lot on board, and, 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 and we'd really recognise that. But as well, Pat, um, the farm as, as part of a broader rural community, and building that bridge between the farmer and the other rural dwellers, I think is really important. Um, uh, if we're to kind of get on to where we need to go with that, because I think there is a danger um, that in an increasingly urbanized society, there's false ex expectations of, of what farming is. And just as, as an anecdote, I mean, there was a beautiful program on about the burn uh, a few weeks ago on RT, a two part series. But I mean, this representation of farming I felt was ridiculous. It, it was totally misleading. Um, and that's, I worry a little bit um, that as we become more urbanized and we, we get so much information from social media, we can have false expectations or ideals about farming. So that's why we need to bring the public out onto those farms so they can understand what farming is like and so the farmers can understand where the public are coming from with their expectations as well. Uh, there's a question in there about the, the mix of income at this point from uh, of the farmers, uh, what uh, element of it can come from commercial uh, and uh, uh, payments, uh, I suppose they, there's single farm payment, have you any information on the, the breakdown of the income of the farmers that, that are, are in the borough? We, we did some work with the National Farm Survey before, um, but because we have such a massive diversity of, of farmers, it'd be hard to give you a, a, a short and easy answer. So uh, for a lot of our farmers, um, they're working, they're now working part time. The farmer, the farm wife, I'd say about 60% um, have, have an off-farm income. Um, some of the larger farmers and maybe some of the older farmers are still fully reliant on farming. Uh, the farming income fluctuates. If you're to look at, um, if you're to use the National Farm Survey model, they're probably breaking even or maybe losing money on, on, on the farming operation if they factor in their own time. The agri environmental payments, um, including the, the um, uh, area aid, I suppose, AMC, um, is significant. Most farmers here would have um, gloss payments, um, four to five thousand. The average payment from the burn program would be in the region of maybe um, five or six thousand on top of that. So you could say maybe around ten thousand from agri environmental payments. Uh, some farmers then have little side businesses, um, not many, around tourism um, or maybe making gates. Some farmers have opportunities for farm employment now and uh, in, in, in acting as contractors or whatever. So there's lots of opportunities, um, but hard to realise a full-time income pack from farming at the same time in the barn. And we'd like to see our payments rate grow in future and for farmers to be um, rewarded um, more as, as these things evolve, because what they produce in the barn is, is of it's like the golden veil of Ireland, if you want to look at it from the biodiversity point of view, and we'd like to see our farmers awarded more. One other thing I'd say is that I think for farming, I think the relevance of what you do as a farmer is always important. When any of us get up in the morning, we want to feel that what we do makes a difference. And I think the notion of food production has been denigrated a little bit in its terms of its importance. But I think being part of the Barn program, I think hopefully at least for some farmers has given them the, the notion of what they do is valued by society. Uh, so as well as food producers, good quality food, they're also produced in a great environment. And I think that makes it a little bit easier to, to get up in the morning and to operate as a farmer. And then we have a comment coming in here, I, I think it's worth reading out. It's saying, listening to today's webinars. So, so the title of today's webinar should have been supporting farmers, not motivating farmers. Uh, farmers are motivated and are experts. 
most of the current farmers have not had any opportunity to get an environmental degree and should be praised for what they have managed to achieve in, uh, as individuals without that educational support. There is a very positive future for us all working and learning together. So I think that's a very nice uh, uh, comment I think that captures a lot of, of what we're talking about here today a, a question here about uh, the farming for nature are, are farming for nature incentives available nationally or are they dependent on local schemes being established so farming for nature is is, is a, a a little non-profit initiative that we set up I I, I, I spend a good bit of time on it completely on a voluntary basis um so it's, it's supported by Board BIA, the Department of Ag and NPWS. We have a part-time coordinator, but really what Farm for Nature tries to do is it tries to you know, identify farmers who are really innovating and delivering on, on the environmental front. Um, it could be through forestry or through um, regenerative farming practices or through hill farming, sustainable hill farming practices or so on. Identify those farmers, make short films about them um, so that the public can get an insight into, into what it's like, have a public competition so people can tune in and, and look at this and vote for their favourite farmer, um, have awards so we recognise and celebrate those farmers within the broader farming community, um, have webinars so that those farmers can share the knowledge. There's no associated grant aid or funding that goes with it. Whatever few resources we have, we invest in maybe organising events like the farm walks and then organising the website and commissioning films and stuff like that. So it's more of a, an exercise in, 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 uh, in, in promoting the right type of farming and having those farmers' voices heard. And it's a lovely little idea. It's, it actually started in the barn years ago because we wanted to, to highlight to farmers what this notion of the good farmer is, is all about. Um, because I think farmers are very sensitive. It's a very public um, 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 profession. In other words, your, your fields are there in public view, your livestock are. But we wanted to help redefine what it meant to be a good farmer as, as a guy who is you know, producing great food, is very involved and engaged in the community, but is also producing great environmental values. So we set up a little award system for that. And we, then we expanded it nationally. And at the moment, uh, I think there's about four or five countries in Europe in contact wanting to have a similar set of awards just to turn around this notion of farming being a negative activity when it comes to the environment. And, uh, Brendan, there was a, an announcement made by Chagas that they've appointed a permanent uh, biodiversity researcher this week, uh, which I think is a, is a really positive a step uh, towards developing that expertise within uh, Chagas, but, but also being available to, to the public. I mean, are, what would you see are the gaps in terms of investment and research um, around this topic uh, where think, you'd like I, to see uh you know uh, money going into i think it's, it's huge i think there's a real dearth of innovation um like we've been looking to burn to develop new systems for feeding of animals for you know the transfer of water we use a lot of solar and wind uh when, when we can get it um you know so i think every landscape will have different needs uh, different challenges like uh, the, the control of invasive species is a huge one um, for some farmers uh, how do you do it most effectively so i think um a lot of these eips have tackled some of the research and the innovative approaches to doing that but i think there's much more needed than that and critically getting that information out um so if you want if you want to farm for nature if you want to develop a species rich meadow like who do you ask who do you, who, who do you ask <laughs> really when it comes to it? it's hard to know even where to, where to take the first step and we i think a good first step is to talk to a farmer who's who's done it before i think that's a great way to start because you get kind of practical information so i think mark doesn't need for a lot of research but also a lot of kt around how do you farm for nature and that kt has to be very context specific it has to be specific to that geographical region or terrain or water body whatever it might be uh, so there, lots of questions coming in here so yeah, there, there's, there's one very timely one uh, just regarding schemes is there a merit in mar marrying EIP such as yours and say Glass and, and REAP into a scheme that, in, uh, that ensures rewards uh, for uh, or a payment for uh, 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 results as opposed to current scheme design that's a real one for the Department of Agriculture, isn't it, Pat? But um, I completely believe so. Um, I think, you know, people said when the burn um, um, started off, sure, that's just the burn. But I mean, I have to hand it to the Hen Harrier Project, Freshwater Pearl Muscle Project, what they're doing down in the Reeks uh, EIP in the Black Series of Wicklow. It's phenomenal. They've basically taken those ideas from the burn and made them better at scale. Um, so we've shown you can scale these ideas, these approaches. There's new technology to help, to help do it. 
I can't see why we don't just really ramp this up um, in the next uh, CAP strategic plan because it works. To me, it's all about having that relationship between farm and landscape. This works for farmers, it gives them flexibility, it gives them an incentive, it gives them support when they need it. And it just changes the whole dynamic uh, from this kind of top down. This is what you do. Just sign that piece of paper and be quiet and kind of get on with it. Now, I think some of the envir environmental schemes like reps had good elements. I'm not knocking them all, but I think we have to evolve and have to improve because in spite of the billions that have been spent in the environment, we still have a biodiversity uh, crisis and we need to do better. We always need to do better. And the taxpayer won't tolerate it if we don't do better. So I think I'd agree with that, that, that the question that we need to do better. Now we have an opportunity to do that. There's a, a, a few questions in around the, the scoring and a, a question, is there any conflict and with, uh, say, we coming and, 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 and we're getting a lot more uh, potential uh, uh, scorecards in, in systems. Is it a, something that advisors should be nervous about? Uh, yeah, um, it, it's a very good question. Um, and initially, I think when we were proposing a result-based approach, um, there was a lot. Of, there was a lot. There was a certain degree of um, trepidation um, from farmers as to Jesus, you know, what's this going to be all about, and advisors as well. Uh, and I think from the department, because the department figured that every farmer would be complaining about their score being too low. But like we've had hundreds of farmers over ten years now, and maybe two or three every year appeal their score. And if the appeal is valid, we'll we'll respect it and, and change the score. But farmers understand it's very transparent. The advisors then, like we've we've terrific advisors and I shouldn't uh, not say that they're, they're, they're great people and they have so much integrity they don't have any problem with scoring but the challenge now I can't say anything about REAP I wasn't involved in uh, high up or low down in the development of REAP I hope it's simple and effective because the key to these scoring systems is to keep it simple keep it user friendly and make sure that it rewards the guys who are delivering in terms of effort and outcomes. There's um, a comment there about that. Is there a risk uh, that trying to roll out a results-based system similar to the burn on a national scale would result in a huge increase in admin and payments to planners, and so effectively a reduction of money available to to actually pay farmers? Um, that, that I suppose that's you've, you've kind of highlighted that. I think I think that's the, a legitimate concern, but I think again, it it this can be done very effectively uh, and if you look at the hen harrier project where you have sort of field-based apps to calculate the scores incredibly quickly mm -hmm. i mean when you look at our program mark for a fact the delivery of the result-based element of our program is very low cost very very low cost a quick walk a 30 minute walk across the field and you've got your score the work side of things if you're planning farm works uh, like scrub removal or um you know installation of pathways that takes a huge amount of admin support uh, but that's really a service to the farmer. So I think the way I look at the admin side of things is it's not money leaving the farmer's pocket going off in somebody else's pocket. It's a service being provided and we have to make that service as efficient as possible. I think the result-based approach can actually be done incredibly efficiently uh, at low admin cost, in fact. So I recognise the concern that we really want to see as much money going into farmer's pockets as we can, but um, there is a need for support to the farmers for that and by the way, when people talk about admin and the burn program, like what does admin mean? I'm not here checking numbers all the time. We're here supporting farmers, helping to get permissions, advising them on best practice. That's real advisory support rather than administration. I think that there is always that danger sometimes. I know from my own experience that you can uh, have, you end up spending more time in the office as, as a planner uh, rather than being out on the ground with farmers where, you know, you, you want to be. Uh, and I think that's that's really important to try and get that balance right. Good IT, good IT, Mark, can solve a huge amount of that. You can be out in the field, submit all your data, um, easy peasy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. We're coming up close to time. Uh, Pat, any burning questions there? And unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get through all of them. Yeah, I, I suppose one, one final uh, challenge to, to, to Brendan. How can the excellent work that you've done be improved even further? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. And um, do you know, Pat, if you stand still, you're lost. Uh, if we stand still here in the burn, we, 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 everybody passes us out and we go backwards. So we're all the time wanting to improve and to innovate. The biggest challenge in that regard, I think, for us is that at the moment we focus on the high nature value parts of the farm, the winter just where you know we have the flora and fauna. And we'd really like to have a whole farm approach where we can integrate the lowland and the upland management together. So building a whole farm package, that's one side of things. The other big challenge for me is to add value. Um, like the barn farmers produce great product uh, and produce great biodiversity outcomes. 
that need to be recognized in the marketplace. So to try and get added value through food marketing, but also through maybe educational tourism and, and things like that. I think that's part of the challenge as well, because far, you know, environmental payments of, uh, uh, won't make farming viable. So we have to uh, try to figure out ways of keeping farmers on the land um, and farm families on the land in a viable way. And I suppose the final thing is, is uh, of the, the, the uh, benefit that comes in, uh, and I suppose you may have kind of alluded to the, the answers. How is it? How can we work at trying to make sure that more of it stays in farmers' pockets? Yeah, I, 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 I think um, that's always been a focus for us, um, not to have that kind of leakage. And like we'd all be very conscious of that. I know in the other programs as well, equally so. But I think on the farmer side, I'd urge them to reflect on the fact that some of that money can be a good investment in terms of helping the farmer do what he or she needs to do in a more efficient and more long lasting and meaningful way and getting all the paperwork out of their head. Because if we weren't here, most of our farmers just wouldn't do the work because it'll take them, cost them a fortune to get to permissions and uh, arrangements with the local authorities and national parks. All the time spent would be massive. So there's a service being provided as well, I think, as you recognize in Chagas, um, because that's the model you operate on. Okay, Brendan, we're going to have to wrap it up. We're just a little over time. Uh, we could easily go on for another hour, I'd say, with all the, the questions that have come through. But thank you so much for your time uh, today. Inspiring, as always. And uh, I think that the, the messages coming through here today have been extremely positive. And uh, I think people are delighted to have a, a positive news story uh, for change. Uh, sometimes it can be that the narrative uh, can be a little bit negative. Uh, so it's important to, to, to keep that positive uh, attitude, I think, towards towards these things. Um, you, can, you can send me on some of those positive messages for one of the dark, <laughs> darker Monday mornings that I often face around here. So thanks very much, Mark. Good, 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 good. Thanks to everybody for the questions. Get them blown up for you and you can put them as a, a poster behind you there. Um, Pat, thanks a lot for helping with questions this morning. And I, I also want to uh, thank our production team, Andy Boland and Yvonne Maher, for uh, all the work going on in the background. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to hear from Neve Gillen from Grass, a Gas Networks Ireland, who's going to be talking to us about renewable gas and circular economies. So do join us uh, for Neve's uh, presentation and uh, uh, have your questions ready. Um, and we just want, want to wish you a happy biodiversity week. Enjoy the, the remainder of it. And uh, we will hope to catch you next week. So with that, uh, we'll talk to you at 9.30 next Friday. Take care. Thanks, Mark.